Hi, everybody. I hope you can see my screen all right. My name is Regina Olivares, and the title of my presentation is Trapped in a State of Illegality. Oh. Oh. My research question that I'm focusing on is what are the ways in which migration restrictions perpetuate the emotional or physical stress of Nicaraguan women migrants residing in Costa Rica? So in order to do my research, I conducted semi-structured interviews, participant observation, I analyzed select literature, and I also had data provided to me from, by my internship. Um, and so as you saw from my research question, I'm focusing on immigration restrictions, right? I'm not focusing on migration itself as the issue because personally I do not see migration as a problem. Um, human beings have always been mobile and always in search of a better life. So I see as restricting human movement to be inhumane. The reason I'm focusing on Nicaraguan women is because Nicaraguans are the greatest um, migrant population in Costa Rica. There's a 4.7 million people living in Costa Rica 400,000 are documented um, Nicaraguan migrants, but the number actually doubles, or well, it's estimated to double once you take into account undocumented migrants. And the reason I wanted to focus on women is because I recognize that this is a patriarchal system and women are affected disproportionately to men. And um, my own personal experience um, being from Mexico City originally and having migration experience with my family to the United States, along with myself being a woman, is inspiration for this, honestly. And it also contributes to my bias. So one thing that I saw prevalent throughout my entire research is violence. Unfortunately, um, women are facing violence at every step of the migration process. So when they're in Nicaragua, a lot of women are fleeing the vi current violent situation um, caused by Daniel Ortega, a dictator who's been in power for years. Um, and in the process of migration on their journey to Costa Rica, women also face violence. Um, a lot of cases stating, you know, rape, by coyotes and different type of abuse. And once arriving to Costa Rica, a lot of women are once again faced with violence and a lack of rights, which is a precursor to exploitation. I don't know what I just did. Just keep on, just keep on going, my dear. Alrighty, let's keep it going. I'm not sure why it's sideways. Just tell your story, sweetie. Alrighty. So moving on, um, I want to include the fact that Costa Rica is known as a safety zone for migrants, which means that they will receive refugees and asylum seekers. But I also want to point out that a safety zone does not mean resources to protect future safety. Um, continuing on, I found three main um, limitations for women um, um, when it comes to wanting to integrate into Costa Rican society. From literature, I found that their main want is just to integrate into society with respect for their customs, but they face these three main limitations, one of them being labor. Um, they're Absence in any sort of migration policy discourse means that they lack labor rights. Um, and this, in my opinion, seems to be a convenient exclusion. Finding a job as an irregular person is also incredibly difficult in Costa Rica. And I want to include this quote from my supervisor, Maricela, which I think she just puts it perfectly. Many violations of rights happen with workers. Workers always have the threat and fear of deportation which makes it easier for employers to take advantage of them. So another main restriction that we saw was restrictions on health. The situation in Nicaragua, as I said before, has gotten worse and worse. So actually a lot of the psychologists that I talked to that were working with Senderos were telling me that they were not prepared for the gravity of the trauma that they were receiving. You know, the tortures have gotten so bad in Nicaragua that they just, 
aren't aren't even prepared. Um, Senderos provides safe houses for victims of sexual assault um, who are migrants. And usually these will last for one month, but lately they've been lasting um, for three months actually. Continuing on, um, the final one is xenophobia and gender discrimination, which works in conjuncture with the other two struggles that I discuss. Um, there's so, so many anti-Nicaraguan sentiments um, present currently, and these anti-Nicaraguan sentiments affect women in the labor force and also with health. You know, they can be turned away from doctor's offices just for being Nicaraguan, which is illegal, by the way, um, but it many cases have happened, has happened. And also, of course, um, when it comes to work, they can face exploitation during that. One of my favorite things though, that Senderos has done is this thing called Tardes de Café. And it was completely organized by members who were receiving aid from uh, the organization. Tardes de Café is an afternoon where women can organize, get together, and they pretty much just talk. You know, they rant, they cry, they give each other massages. Can you turn the volume down, please? Sorry. Um, so this is truly a testament to Senderos, the way that women are accessing these resources. Continuing on. Furthermore, Senderos, I want to explain a little bit more about exactly what it is. It is a center for the social rights of migrants. Um, made very clear to me by the president founder, it is not only a nonprofit organization, it is a center for rights. Um, and women migrants created this for women migrants. So who better knows their community than the community itself, you know? Um, and at the end of the day, the services that they're providing makes it very easy to see where the faults lie in the way the Costa Rican government protects their neighbors or says that they're protecting their neighbors. This is a quote from Adilia, who is the president founder of Senderos. And she explains a little bit here about why she wanted to begin working with women and why this organization of women formed. And it's because women have always been at the forefront of fight in Nicaragua. Um, here's a little bit of information that's provided by Sendero. So, you know, they give information about insurance, a little bit of information about regularization, um, prevention of violence. And these are the two main places that I was. I was in Upala, which is up at the border of Nicaragua and Costa Rica. And I was in Barrio Mexico, San Jose, um, which is in the center. Another huge, huge thing that they do is community engagement and community outreach. It's mainly what they're focused on. Um, this woman right here actually was able to receive the first um, donations from Senderos to begin her pulperia, a little store um, out of her own garage. And she's actually living off of it now. Um, she was able to get a certificate in entrepreneurship, which she was extremely excited about. And finally, one of the, some of the main services they provide are health and legal services for women. So whether this be mental health, physical health, accompanying them to doctors if they need, um, just making sure that they're accessing the rights that they do have. And so finally, um, I was going to say that as Latin Americans, you know, this really applies to us, but I think that this just applies to the entire world. We all share a history of exploitation at the hands of capitalism. And unfortunately, I do not see a solution to this issue while under the hold of capitalism because it relies too much on the exploitation of migrants for cheap labor. It perpetuates injustice. And I think as long as restrictions on rights perpetuate injustice and benefits a select few financially, I think that these injustices are going to continue. Women are absent from migration policy in 
it's not because, you know, we haven't spoken loudly. It's because we've been silenced. And I think this is why working with Senderos was like so incredible and so fulfilling to me. One of the best experiences for me was when I interviewed Brasilia right here, you can see her in my slide. Um, she's also one of the founders of Senderos. She's not that active anymore in the organization. Um, but when I interviewed her, I didn't have a tripod that day. So my arm was just like dead and she was going on and on like all day, you know, just talking and talking. So finally the interview finishes and I'm like, okay, lunchtime, like, me and her go in to prepare our lunch and she asked me if she can see the video. So of course I give her the camera and I'm letting her watch it off the camera. And this is like one of those times where I just wish I had my camera to like videotape her, but she was using it. So I didn't have it. Um, but she was just watching this video of herself talk about how she, along with 400 other women have began this movement and she had the biggest smile on her face, you know, and I was just thinking, you know, if this case study and if this documentary is reaching 53 more ears, that's 53 more ears that are going to hear these women's stories, which I think is amazing. Um, but I think the best part about Brasilia's interview is how she was describing the growth of the organization. You know, she began by describing it as this little sprout and now it's this tree, you know, with branches and with effects and it's continuously growing. And I just think this is such a beautiful way to think about the growth of a center for rights. You know, it's a tree of empowerment. Thank you. Wow, that's beautiful, Regina. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. wow. We have uh, ample time for uh, some questions. So again, please, if you have questions, kindly put them in the chat. That because there are a lot of us, maybe putting it in the chat is probably the best option. Um, too. Well, actually, I don't even think I shared my final. Uh, oh. Yeah. oh. Slide with you guys back. Well, what's the main takeaway that you want us to, uh, what's the most important message that you want us to take away from this? Well, you know, I think the most important takeaway, like I said, is focusing on our similarities and focusing on the common enemy, enemy at the end of the day. You know, if we're all sharing this history of exploitation and oppression, we need to find a solution to this. And as I said, it's not that women haven't been speaking their voices, it's that women have been silenced. And I think we have power in numbers. Uh, wonderful, wonderful. Um, okay, so Jose Olivares, I may recognize this last name. Oh, uh, yeah. Marxist theory, the concept of class consciousness is key. Um, so Betsy, you focus on uh, working class migrant women. I am curious if during your research, the working class women you spoke with were class conscious and if Senderos would help people realize this class consciousness. So you talk about this as a center for rights and uh, we've heard you talk about the uh, economic and social and psychological empowerment, but um, do they also, uh, hear this great question, do they also, um, does Senderos also help raise class consciousness to uh, enter into the battle you just described? Hmm. I would say so, absolutely. Um, you know, it was actually very interesting because a lot of the conversations that I had with my colleagues included a lot of Marxist theory um, and a lot of them were very familiar with the Zapatista movement in Mexico, which was just really cool to me because that's like one of my favorite movements of all time. And so just being able to discuss this with them and uh, it was amazing. Yeah, I, I would say absolutely Senderos does help people realize this class consciousness um, that comes along with, or that this gender discrimination comes along with. Okay, okay, wonderful. We have um, another question too from uh, uh, Justine um, Orlando. Uh, thank you for this powerful presentation, Rahina. I am wondering if the youth play a role in organizing efforts. Oh, yes! I wanted to speak about this. I, yeah, I really want to 
speak about this actually because one of my duties also for my internship was developing workshops for children um, to develop their self-esteem through art. And, you know, they need so much support right now with children. And that's, this is what they were telling me, you know, they have the safe houses for the women and they have the psychologist. But what about when the moms have to go see the psychologist, you know, who's taking care of the kids when they have to go to the doctor or trying to find work. This is a huge, huge struggle and something that Senderos is trying to overcome right now. And they just need the resources at the end of the day. Do, um, let's see, here's a, just a wonderful, simple question. Um, where to go? What are some ways to keep women from being silenced? That is a great question. Yeah, women being silenced. People, women have been raising their voices, you said, all along, but they're not being heard. Absolutely. I mean, I think it is really important to recognize that we're living in a patriarchal system. So it's years and years of silencing populations. You know, it's almost like we have to take it into our own hands now. And once again, maybe start this revolution small, but I think it can grow into something huge where everyone's voices can be heard, hopefully. Okay, very inspirational. Uh, there's another question which talks about perhaps the uh, trans, uh, transferability of some of the ideas that you have shared here. So uh, how, uh, this is from Nicole, um, amazing job. How do you think, uh, how do you begin to think about relate your research in Costa Rica with these migrant women to issues surrounding migrants, and maybe say, we say migrant women? In That's the a very interesting question because um, when I, do compare immigration policy in the United States with Costa Rica. Costa Rica is way more humane, I guess would be the word. Um, like I said, they're regarded as a safety zone. So they're actually accepting people to come into their country. You know, they have services to help people and they're not imprisoning them at the border or deporting them like they are here, um, which is a really sad reality. Oh goodness, oh goodness gracious. Um, tell, what, what are Senderos' next steps and how are they being recognized and seen as a power in Costa Rica itself and regionally perhaps? Can you discuss that? Um, absolutely, Senderos right now is struggling a little bit with um, the UN kind of coming in and taking a bit of their jobs. So Senderos has been installed in this community for more than 20 years and the UN came with a bunch of funds for different projects that they had already come up with and they started funding these projects, which is great, right? Um, and then they cut the funds. So, and then they took over the programs also. Um, and so the women that were originally working, which were Nicaraguan women migrants are no longer working there. A lot of people were actually laid off of their jobs in Senderos. Mm -hmm. And it's just because of this giant organization, you know, um, not even organization, it's, I would say that it is an imperialist power, the UN. So it's, I just, yeah, I find it interesting how it does play its roles, role in kind of affecting the future of smaller organizations that are more local. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I want to ask have a ask a final question, and again, you've been getting lots of praise, um, everyone so from nervous. everyone here. I was uh, so nervous. <laughs> you alluded to a documentary. Oh yes! Can you please tell us more about this uh, documentary that you are uh, developing? Absolutely. You developed one both for Senderos, and then you're also uh, creating an academic documentary for. Uh, for your work at uh, Global, which we hope we will see very soon. Yes, um, if anybody is interested in seeing either of those, just shoot me an email, I would love to send that out. And yeah, like I said, just the more ears we can get on people's stories, I think the better, absolutely. Okay, thank you. I'll be presenting on my research case study I did last semester entitled Landing on Your Feet, Youth Empowerment and Identity Through Transformative Theater. And it's a case study on mass transit, street theater, and video. They are an arts for social justice organization 
and um, interactive and transformative theater company located mainly in the Bronx, New York, but they also do work elsewhere and throughout Manhattan as well, but mainly located in the Bronx. Before I kind of get into everything about my case study and this presentation, I did want to kind of let you guys know that um, this was something for me personally that was really amazing because art has been something that's really been a factor and reoccurring thing in my life. And so being able to not only have the opportunity to research, but work with and become friends with and join and sit beside a community that's as artistic and as amazing as this was really amazing. And because of that, it made me realize that I really wanted to focus this case study on having mass transit define the issues surrounding it um, and why they're doing what they're doing for themselves. Um, but with that, as obviously giving a global context as well as a greater scale of the issue, I'll be listing some different statistics on global issues around youth empowerment and development and some specifically in the Bronx. But a huge part of my research as well was, and a part of the ethics behind it, was not focusing too much on the statistics. So while they're about to be listed, um, you'll see later on that I'll be redefining those. And especially, we don't want to promote statistics that drown out amazing community work, like the work that Match Transit's doing. So with that being said, um, so yeah, disempowerment of marginalized youth globally um, really is hard to measure. Um, I found a report from the UN World, it's from their World Youth Report, um, kind of talking about their sustainable development goals. And in regards to youth development, they even specifically say that analyzing and quantifying youth around the world, what they're going through and what they're doing is also really hard to gauge and analyze. Um, but they also divide, um, define marginalized youth as um, this group of people. Um, and also, I love the fact, and I'm including this because they stated that youth around the world, also, these are intersecting identities and present tons of different challenges that occur with all of these different world issues going on at the moment. So kind of zooming super into the United States and specifically the Bronx, New York, where my um, research was conducted, um, just to kind of give you guys a context, the Bronx is one of the five boroughs in New York City um, that has a population of 1.43 million. And a part of that um, population, over half are Hispanic or Latinx, and 28.9% are Black or African American, and less than 9% are white. So it also kind of gives context of who is living in this community, and also that mo the majority of the population falls under that determination of marginalized youth. So um, when looking at the Bronx and looking at youth, um, one of the main statistics that comes up is in regards to youth disconnection, which refers to youth not currently enrolled in school or not working. And this is kind of defined as a major problem going on with youth at the moment. Um, in the Bronx, the South Bronx specifically, they have the highest percentage in all of New York City of this. And just to kind of compare that, the lowest percentage, which is Manhattan, um, I think that's just interesting to compare because I'm sure as most of you know, those demographics are also completely different socioeconomic standpoints. So seeing that, and also just how geographically close they are, but how much distance there is socially with that, I think is important to note. Um, also then kind of just rolling it back around to the arts and education and youth. Most of us know this as well, that arts around the country are not funded in 2015. This looks like a huge number funded, but realistically that year, science has got about $2 billion for funding. Um, so in New York City, that also affects schools greatly. Between 2006 and 2013, art funding dropped by an 84%. And if you haven't guessed it, low-income communities such as the South Bronx are the most impacted by that. So now kind of flipping it around to the positive aspect of arts as a solution, curricular and extracurricular arts studies and activities help high-risk dropout students stay in school. So they directly, it's directly shown that they um, help combat that disconnection, as well as just promoting creativity, identity development, social development, self-worth, all of the good stuff that youth need. Um, also, brain research shows that um, art and specifically theater and music, which 
my case study is about a theater group, close the gap between high and low income, low income students' academic achievement. So now kind of bringing it even closer into mass transit, one thing that isn't, you don't often find when looking up statistics of empowerment or disempowerment of youth in the Bronx is the fact of lack of representation. Um, and that's not, that's not just in arts, but also in teachers in their schools. And one thing that was kind of common in my findings, which I'll talk about later, is lack of representation as an issue. This is a quote from Kevin, who is a current member of Mass Transit, saying, I can see them, see them, see me, see them in me. It's a lot of words. It's like kind of a word jumble, but we all kind of like took a step back and we were like, that describes it so perfectly of why they're doing what they're doing. It's not because the percentage of youth disconnection is so high. It's because they want them to see who they can be. And also Kevin being a Bronx native definitely relates to that as well. Um, another thing about the Bronx that I think is really important to note quickly is the immense history of arts or social justice movements, civil rights movements, activism, artists in the Bronx. And that's something that when you look up statistics on the Bronx, the statistics of how much art and culture in that city does not often come up. Um, and I, it's important to note because Mass Transit has been around since 1970, and they originally started being a street theater company performing in subways and in front of city halls. Um, and on the left, that's Jerry Kofta, who I interviewed, who's one of the co-founders of Mass Transit. But he told me that um, the reason they moved to centrally locate in the Bronx and serve that community wasn't because they were marginalized, wasn't because of this, but because it was and still is such a huge epicenter for art and social movements. Um, this is just an image from the Bronx History Collaborative, which I'll be referencing a lot in my final thesis work about mass transit, but they are an example of an organization that's trying to bring to light this history and this history of art and social movements. So basically my question is asking, how does mass transit street theater and video empower youth and promote youth development in communities of the Bronx? Also, um, it's not staying my question, but while I was with them last fall, they did do some performances in Manhattan. So that's also referencing, but majority, most of the time they are working with communities in the Bronx. Through aspects of arts or social justice framework, such as interpersonal storytelling and performance, this translates to why and how and what Mass Transit is doing. So Mass Transit is going on, this year is their 50th year anniversary. Um, they right now are a super small collective of just five to six artists um, that work to promote racial equity, emotional literacy, social justice and social justice using original plays, videos, educational workshops and interactive theater. Um, so just before I kind of get into my findings, some critical um, my critical th and theoretical framework for this really had a huge theme of um, looking at a lot of the key thinkers in intersectionality work um, and intersectional frameworks and feminist theory, because dealing and talking about um, different identities and not of the youth they're serving, but of the people in mass transit, um, and being under the oppressive and power-ridden and privileged society we live in in the US, um, I think it's really important to have that intersectional framework throughout my research, as well as it prevented tunnel vision and my own bias and, view, bias and viewpoints. Um, because as you guys can see, I'm a white woman and this is um, a majority POC cast. And also I'm not from New York, let alone the Bronx. Um, so this is a definitely new community I'm experiencing as well as I've never done theater before. The aspect of being in a theater space was also very new. And just in general, intersectionality and identity work through theater are super intertwined as well. So it's really important. Just quickly, some key literature. Um, I referenced a lot of Augusto Ball's work on theater of the oppressed and other case studies and academic works that talk about it around the world because it's one of the prime examples of transformative theater. And it's also, I compared it a bit because mass transit does something that's really, really unique that theater of the oppressed doesn't. As well as again, some key thinkers like Patricia Hill Collins at intersectionality work, as well as um, Merritt Dewhurst in social um, justice art education. 
So some of my methodology, so obviously I just said that I um, interned with Mass Transit for those three months and I did field participant observation, taking detailed field notes, semi, I did one semi-structured group interview and a bunch of semi-structured one-on-one interviews, taking a detailed field journal as well as visual ethnography that included video and um, photography that I will be applying to my senior thesis film about Mass Transit. Um, and also, of course, informed consent and continuing consent was applied throughout all aspects of my research as well. So I thought it was really important to include the faces of mass transit. So to the left of the orange line on the screen are all of the current members and all of the pictures on the screen and these people I interviewed as well. So Lynn, um, she is the executive director, but her and Joseph are co-artistic directors together. And Joseph, Kayla, Nicolette, Kevin, and Robert make up the actors and artists that um, perform currently. Um, on the right of the line, Taekwon and Janisha are people who were formerly a part of Mass Transit, who are now educators and specifically art educators. So it was really important to get that context of Mass Transit 10 years ago, but also what the artists do post Mass Transit, because artists aren't usually going to stay in it forever. It's a pretty flexible theater company. And then of course, Sherry Kofta, who I mentioned earlier, one of the co-founders. So my findings. So a huge aspect of my findings were the original plays and performances that Mass Transit does. When I was with them last fall, they put on two performances, one of which is Solid Ground, a play about landing on your feet. This is a original play that tells through different monologues, dance and poetry, tells the story of a friend group going through their final eighth grade year moments, their sophomore year, and then it ends with them graduating high school. Um, and they're performing for high school students. So they, and usually high school students who are sophomores or juniors, so they kind of get to see these characters go along this journey with them. And it's been going on, they've been doing this performance for 10 years um, as of 2020. So I'm going to play a quick video of um, some of the final monologues um, from that graduation sequence when they're really, the characters are realizing their identity, who they are, and we've seen them overcome so much. Um, and I think it's really important to share. When we slay, it's not the, like windmill bumps and broken back doors, black boys and girls playing for you to pick up with their souls, shouting out plays. Playing as our wheels, trying to hologram our heart, two dots in the heavens that they died for the year. You reach them. Self-definition of me. I love my kinky hair and my dark skin. Makes me different than white Americans. 34, 25, 36. We are not plastic bodies. Don't mold me into the false imagery of a star. <laughs> I'm the brightest star you've ever seen. The fastest you can star in the Milky Way galaxy, you cannot reach me. No, all I need is one mic on me. One stage, one person front. My face on the front page. Only if I had one love. One girl and one trade. One God to show me how to do things. The sun did it pure. Like a cup of virgin blood. Mixed with one fifty one. One simple trial. You can see my name in the hieroglyphs. Like Osiris and Isis. The arrows written inside the iris. It's technology. We've been all tricked out of the bottom. So let me continue the PowerPoint. So yeah, that's um, just some excerpts from those final monologues. And I just think also a performance and piece that has been going on for 10 years is something amazing and for such a small theater company. So I wanted you guys to get a feel of what they do. So quickly, um, the second performance and piece that they were doing last fall while I was conducting this research is entitled Power Myths. It's based off of Lynn Fisher's Power Lens Theory, which I'll get into in a bit. Um, and it reminds me a lot, if you guys have seen Zootopia from Disney, it takes super abstract characters um, and they have them discuss a power that can't be taken away from them. Um, for example, there's this um, owl named Connie who Kayla plays, who 
has amazing rap skills and Lin-Manuel Miranda comes over and asks her to defend the rights of rats in New York City and write a play about it. Um, so it's like super fantastical stuff like that that teaches elementary school kids power dynamics. And I was watching this performance for the first time and I teared up. And even though it's like them goofing around stage, it's so important because if I had that, if anyone had that growing up, I feel like we'd be able to understand power and how that works in our own lives so much more clearly. And also at the end, they do an improvised version where they ask the audience to um, join in and um, create a story for themselves. So it's really powerful. So there are two aspects um, of these original plays and performances that make Mass Transit super unique than any other transformative theater group I've seen as well as, and specifically in New York as well. So one of the aspects is interactive theater, which um, takes form in talkbacks and Q and A's they do after the shows. So instead of just doing this performative theater piece that's super empowering, making you cry, and then telling the students to go home, um, they talk to them and they're like, how'd you feel about it? Let's have a discussion. And it also breaks down that wall um, for the audience and also breaks down power dynamics within their performance. Quickly, I'm almost wrapping up. So um, also the other aspect is Lynn's power lens theory, which she created as a graduate student, which basically it ponders the question, what is a power that can't be taken away from you for youth? And it's a tool to analyze power dynamics in education workshops and art. So they apply the power lens theory in how they write their performances and how they run as an organization. Joseph said um, and described power, the power lens in an interview as the breadcrumbs to the soul, which I thought was just really poetic and beautiful. So my last slide wrapping up a discussion and kind of implications of how mass transit and how what they're doing and what I just described to you fits in to a wider context and discussion is that mass transit's transformative theater work and education frameworks as well aid to bigger global issues that I kind of listed before of um, adding to arts education for um, minority groups in urban spaces and specifically the Bronx. But they also, like I said, do something so incredible with talking to the audience and imply, like applying power literacy that also adds to these wider conversations, adds to what Augusto Ball was trying to do with theater of the oppressed and creates new ways for our education. And also it adds to just the wider conversation to around um, lack of representation and proper representation in art spaces and low income communities. And finally, I wanted to kind of leave you guys with another excerpt that um, Joseph said in an interview, which he, um, he always says, and he said, talked about it in an interview, but he also says it at the end of every performance, specifically the Power Miss one where they create their own thing. He is like, you have seen something that will be created today and that will not exist past this stage, but now you are left to continue that art and work through that. And that's also super impactful for those elementary school kids after that power miss performance because they create this improv piece. And he's like, you just created something that will never be created before and has never been, cre been created before you too. So it's really great. These are just some of my key references. And thank you guys for listening. Questions, here's my contact info. Yes. Love it. Oh goodness, that's so amazing. So please uh, put your questions up on the chat. And um, Nicole, can you also put your email in the chat so that uh, yes. we can, um, anyone who's interested can continue that dialogue with you. Uh, you're getting some amazing praise. Um, you, uh, uh, it was really interesting because you know it's waiting for some questions to come up. Um, oh yes, um, wait. There's one. Since you've done so much work in urban communities, what assumptions can you make about the impact of small theater on, say, a rural community? That's from when. Mm. Yeah. Well, um, I see Louie is here right now, but I remember when we were in China, um, we were visiting a community outside of Taiwan, mm -hmm. and that was actually the first time I had been exposed to theater as a social justice tool and an education tool and empowerment tool. Um, I can't remember the name of the organization offhand, but they were um, 
doing communal theater pieces for communities, um, for a specific rural community in Taiwan. And I think for rural communities, it could actually be a lot more inclusive with not just youth and schools, but the whole community because of how less populated a lot of rural communities are. So I remember that organization, um, the whole community was there. Eight month olds to like 80 year olds were there experiencing it and learning it together. But obviously like in urban spaces with so many people, um, it is it is kind of more important to focus on like specific demographics and age groups. So I think rural communities could have an impact on a wide age, a wide age range, probably. But I think it can definitely be done and has been being done. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for your question. One wonderful. And then another question, and here's the question. What are you going to take with this amazing knowledge that you've collected and these tools for being a change maker that you've developed in, among them videography? Yeah, well, um, so I kind of, I don't, I kind of forget if I briefly mentioned it or not, but for my thesis work, I'll be revising this case study as well as creating a documentary film focusing on what Mass Transit is doing. Um, so I'm hoping that as far as the work, that film, and I'll be giving that film to them as well as all the footage, and that's a collaborative work. Um, but also, so through the film, I hope that that can be a tool for them to be able to spread their story more and for people to stumble along that on a public platform or on their website and get that sense of who Mass Transit is. But as far as like taking away for myself personally, is that I think two things, one with research, and I don't think I'm going to be a researcher in the future. Um, not that I didn't enjoy this project, but I don't know if it's the path I'm going to go on. But I think discussing having people in their own communities tell them stories for themselves, giving platforms for that is a huge takeaway from what I applied to my research, but also what I learned from them, as well as it doesn't matter how many people there are, art and change can be made so instantaneously and that can be a moving cycle like I just when I went in I didn't even see a show of them first I attended a lot of their rehearsals and it was just all six of them including me with a video camera in this rehearsal space and I was just brought to tears every time they were also brought to tears and they've been performing the play for like 10 years so it's like even if it's just seven people in a room that's still change being made even if there's not an audience there as well but yeah, that's a lot of points, a lot of things to take away. Well, thank you.